Can we have our first question, please? Is the microphone on? Okay. Uh, I think it is. Just uh, okay. move a little closer if All you right. can. Um, Judith Lappin from Agricola Oz. Um, I'd like to ask a question, first of all, to Dr. Chan, perhaps a, a minor one, but uh, I'm interested. I noticed on one of your graphs uh, or tables, you showed that uh, Gujarat state's agricultural um, growth rate was about 6.8% and the Punjab was really low, about 1.6 or something, whereas the Punjab used to be one of the stars of the Green Revolution. So I just wondered uh, what was happening there. Uh, and also to both uh, Dr. Chand and Dr. Garba, in terms of um, public debate and public policy thinking in both India and the US, about ownership of the supply chain from uh, the producers right through to markets. Um, what sort of thinking is going on? For example, in the US, the fact that um, uh, JBS of Brazil has become the largest meat processor in the US and, and owner of meat production, uh, and that anheuser Bush has become part of InBev. Uh, is there much con um, debate, uh, thinking about what's happening in terms of control of supply chains into major markets. Uh, and perhaps um, uh, Mick might want to throw in a comment or two as well. Two questions there, Dr. Chan. The, the first one, probably the easy one. Yeah, you are right. Uh, Punjab has very high productivity, but it is plateauing. So in terms of growth, it is not taking place in Punjab. But in other states, their productivity is very low, about half of Punjab or two-thirds of Punjab, so growth is taking place there. So, so that is the reason that in Punjab, you find that already beet productivity, rice productivity, it is closer to the plateau. So you don't find much growth, and also much diversification is not taking place. So Punjab, no doubt, still productivity is higher than many other states. Punjab sometime is at the top, sometime at number two or number three in terms of productivity. But since productivity is high, so growth is not uh, high in the state of Punjab. Coming to your uh, second question on supply chain, in India, the supply chain is fragmented. In fact, we feel that that some, some changes in regulation in market is required so that the direct purchase by, 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 by processors, by exporter from the farmer is allowed. Right now, because agriculture is a state subject, it is allowed only in two, three states. Most of the other states, they have not amended their market act, but central government is providing some incentive to all these states to amend their Agriculture Market Act to facilitate and encourage this direct purchase from the farmer by the processor or by the exporters. In fact, we are, we are putting some reliance on this integration of value chain for increase in realization of prices by farmers, even if price don't increase. So through this integration of supply chain, the prices received by farmer will increase even if the prices are not increasing otherwise. Mm. Joe Glauber, would you like to comment yeah. on that um, question as well? well? It's a very good question. There, there's certainly been a lot, uh, as you're well aware, or it sounds like you're well aware at least, of, of, of what's been going on in the U.S. in terms of integration of, of supply chains. And I, and I think there really there is this drive for competitiveness and to lower costs and and so and I think to agree to to an effort to try to tie producers to consumers, so that we're seeing a lot more contracting, uh, and, and I'm thinking particularly in the meat area, uh, where you're looking for specific qualities out of out of that beef or pork or or, or poultry, and then moving that through, you know, to export markets, and so you see. Um, a lot of this, I, I think, again, the, the whole issue of, of lowering the cost of logistics, 
lowering the costs uh, so that you could be more competitive. And you can see, I mean, I, the, I thought the freight chart was, was a fascinating one, but what probably is even more instructive is to look at how much it costs to get something out of the, the, the middle of the country to port and then out. And there you, you still see uh, countries like Brazil, where uh, you know they're they're just less competitive on that side, they're getting much much better. But I think this is an overall drive that we'll see. There are there are competition issues. Um, I think that we're certainly aware of those. We have, um, um, a, 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 you know, our, we have antitrust issues that that come up now and again with with mergers and that sort of thing that are looked at but i think generally the trends are certainly for for more highly integrated markets mickey oh, i loved uh, the key messages the take-home messages from you um, you talked about past reputation are we living in the past i'm suspicious that we are i'm suspicious that we smugly tell ourselves that we're very good and uh, we're clean and green and we're efficient and environmentally friendly and all that sort of stuff. And I don't think even our consumers here in Australia believe that. Mm. Um, and if we haven't convinced them of that, I'm not sure that we're going to convince Asian consumers to put out extra dollars because we sure aren't going to be able to compete on price. Mm. Graham. Uh, Graham Peart, Agricultural Consultant. Uh, three questions to Dr Chan and I'll start with the easy ones. Um, can you tell us what is happening in the management of the Indian beef herd that no matter what we did in Australia, we couldn't get anything like uh, the increases that you are getting in volumes of export? We understand the Brazilians are chopping down the Amazon and increasing their beef uh, production, but India is totally different. Should I stop there? And I'll keep it to one, if you don't mind, Graham, because there are two other questions and we're very close to morning tea. So, Dr Chan. This beef export from India is mainly buffalo. Very little cattle, mainly buffalo. Uh, in fact, in India, what happened is that uh, male calf of buffalo, they have no use in the, in the country because uh, their use as draft power is also very low. And uh, earlier, um, they were just made to die through starvation, through disease, or something like that. Then I think during seven, eight, some development took place in other beef exporting country. It could be mad cow disease, swine flu, and so many things. And the, the importing country, consuming country, they just found that, that the, the beef import from India does not carry those kind of risk because it is free of those, those kind of uh, diseases. And also, this beef export and mutton exports from India is organic because it is largely on grazing and, and, and like that. And also, earlier, FMD used to be a big issue foot and mouth disease. But we have now most of the country as FMD free. So, so that is also a big contributing factor that once it was declared by international agency as a FMD free area, the, the export started. And also, I think this rupee dollar exchange depreciation and uh, government of India just uh, giving uh, some encouragement and also some concessions to the meat exporters, uh, that also contributed. Two final questions, and we need to be brief. Uh, one final one up there, but see, you're next. I asked Bruce Watson, Nuffield Scholar, question for Mick. Firstly, thank you very much for your presentation, and some of your comments pointing out how Australia's we're gonna move towards basic commodity type exports, and feeding on your comments about beef shipping costs. Probably our only source of competitive advantage is gonna be supply chains. Wondering if you could give us some thoughts on how you think Australia can strip more costs or get more investment into our supply chains, either from an industry or government point of view. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm necessarily qualified in the post-farm uh, gate uh, phase, but I suspect uh, it's going to have to be automation. Uh, I, th I think labour costs have traditionally been uh, a quite a major aspect of meat processing costs. And we don't have uh, the 
the luxury of seven dollars an hour minimum wages that uh, that our friends uh, our friends have uh, in terms of their processing facilities. So I think the only way is going to have to be um, to strip labour out of um, you know the post farm processing sector, and that of course requires investment. And and I just um, investment usually necessitates profitability before that that happens. And I, I I wonder whether we're trapped in that sort of a double bind where. Um, the way to get more efficient in terms of the supply chain is to, uh, to get the labour out, but that requires investment and that requires that you've got the capital to spend and uh, I guess that's a question for our meat processors rather than me. Uh, on transport, there's certainly some gains that could be made. Um, I don't think they're huge, I don't think they're spectacular, but I think there's certainly some gains that could be made um, as well, but uh, they're the two areas that I think are probably the most likely. And final question up the back. Uh, I'm home from um, AWS. Uh, my question is to Professor Chan. Uh, you have uh, summarized your um, description quite uh, nicely, uh, giving some challenges to the Indian agricultural system overall. And do you see any role of uh, policy in dealing with those challenges? And um, do you anticipate some policy changes in the horizon? Thank you. In fact, uh, policies have very important role. Um, policies consist of so many things, but main role of policy in terms of better price realization to farmers. We are just finding at national level and also at provincial level that wherever there is improvement in terms of trade for agriculture, price realization for, by farmers, it is making tremendous difference to agriculture growth the state of Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, how growth rate could be high. Because the concerned state, they adopted the system of decentralization procurement. So they assured to farmer that minimum support price will be paid to them. And that changed the equation in those two states. But in the other states, UP, Bihar, neither the union government is procuring, nor the central state governments are procuring. So fi you find the price that accrues to farmers is invariably 15, 20% lower than what is the minimum support price. So since farmers are not getting remunerative prices, you find that, that they don't use modern inputs and all those things, so low kind of growth. So policies have very important role, particularly when there is a productivity gap, that attainable yield and actual yield, there is a big gap. So that gap which can be filled, that does not require technology. That just requires a little bit extension and also this policy is for uh, some sort of assurance to the farmers, in, either in terms of MSP system or in terms of competitive markets or efficient markets. Time flies when you're having a very interesting session. Sadly, we are out of it. Our speakers this morning, Dr. Ramesh Chan, Dr. Joe Glauber and Mick Keogh. Would you please thank them?